It's movie time, and we're back in with movie time. How are you all? I hope that you had a wonderful, wonderful weekend, and welcome to Wednesday's movie time. I am here in tonight, and we have an incredible guest, as promised. Mr. John Reese is with us, and tonight, before we introduce Mr. Reese, we have with us our co-host, Arpo. Hey, Arpo, how are you doing? Oh, just fine. I'm sitting here in what was my bed last night. We've had four days of continuous rain, and my roof sprang a leak right over my bed. That sucks. Oh, my goodness. And also uh, tonight, our wonderful guest, Mr. John Reese. How are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, it's end of the day, a little biz a little tired, so and totally swamped, but happy to be here with you. Excellent. I, swamped. Do we know this feeling very well? <laughs> hey, so how John, do people? So, how do people like log in and watch this like right now? Okay, they can go right directly onto the website. Let me give you the link for it. Mm -hmm. um, it is right there on Movie Time with Grace and Sonata. And let me just give you the link as I mentioned. And, and it's, I it will. Stored, it's archived for later, right? Correct. It is archived for later, and that way they can watch it. Okay. Good. Are we still on YouTube Live too? Yes, it is archived, and uh, so they're able to do that. And let me also give you the uh, the link there. I'll put it right there in the chat as well, so that you have it. Also, John, can you tell me a little bit about uh, yourself and your company, and how did we get here? Oh, <laughs> depends on how much you want to spend on that topic. Um, do you have a, a moment? Do you have a drink? And, uh, you know. Uh, Indeed. So, um, well, there's two things. I'm actually hearing an echo, which is a little odd. I don't know whether that's on my side, but that, I'm wondering if that's on your side. Mm. That's in. Try doing it this way. Okay, there we go. That's so, better. You can still hear me, right? Yes, I can. Yes, no, maybe. Yes, we can. Now I can't hear you. Uh oh. Yeah, there we go. You can hear me. There we go. I can hear you very well. Okay, good. So maybe it's just anyway. Sorry about that. So that's okay. Uh, how did I get here? Um, I started off as a um, punk rock um, uh, documentarian back in the early days of San Francisco punk rock, or the middle days of San Francisco punk rock. Mm hmm. Uh, Rock Video Collective. I was actually going to Berkeley and studying economics. I was supposed to go to graduate school in economics um, and decided to leave that and pursue a career in filmmaking. Um, and at the time, punk rock uh, oriented filmmaking. Um, I then ended up making a series of documentaries with a group called Survival Research Laboratories that do performances with large remote controlled robots. Um, and we're actually going to probably start putting that stuff up online soon. Um, and it's kind of like we just digitize the stuff again, etc. cetera. Um, then I went to UCLA Film School, got out of film school, trying to get my first picture made, produced my wife's first picture while waiting for my film to be made um, mm -hmm. at the time, and kind of fell into music videos. Um, fortunately, I was uh, lucky enough to work with Ted Reznor. Um, and he was looking for someone who had done music videos before, and I kind of enjoyed doing all the music videos in the 80s um, because of. Are you hearing the feedback that I'm, yes. I'm hearing myself? A little bit. Um, but I was, that's the same. It's less annoying than when I was listening to my headset, so hopefully yes. it's not too bad. Um, and. Um, Trent was looking for someone who hadn't done music videos before and mm -hmm. like was um, kind of did not like life in this way. The music videos that were made in the 80s, so I could really kind of jump on that bandwagon. Yes. Um, and so made Happiness and Slavery and then a bunch of music videos after that. Kind of the music video world can be a little bit of a hamster wheel. And what I find, you know, one of the things I talk to about filmmakers is that oftentimes they'll end up finding something that they can make money at and becomes kind of a hamster wheel that mm -hmm. is acting from what they really want to do in their creative lives. And sometimes you just have to jump off that hamster wheel. So I kind of jumped off the music video hamster wheel and um, wrote a script 
ended up making two films, films features simultaneously, which were Cleopatra's Second Husband and Better um, Living History, so a narrative of the talk. And both of them uh -huh. had theatrical releases, which was really nice, ended up selling a couple of pitches for scripts during when that was still possible, more possible, um, and then found myself after that on another kind of pitching hamster wheel and realized that it kind of like was taking away from filmmaking, like doing all this pitching but not making film. Mm -hmm. I decided to make Vomit, which actually started, that documentary started as research or a script that I was writing about the world. And um, the, the film never happened. Um, I, I became fascinated by culture and the uh -huh. culture and so fell in that rabbit hole. Um, and um, so what brought me to what I do now is made Vomit, kind of felt it was the best film that I made, certainly felt like it deserved the proper role. We thought that it would sell at a festival at Tribeca, which we were premiering, you know, sold yeah. out. We had six screenings, all of them sold out, standing ovations. We thought, oh my God, and they can sell the film, and, you know, recoup the money, and, you know, go on to the film, which is every filmmaker's unfortunately still dream, you know. Absolutely. Someone else will take my film off my hands, and I won't have to worry about it anymore, and thank God. Um, so, you no, know, that's all. In, in, in 07, that was like the beginning of the chain, in 08. So we really wanted to have, so we ended up getting a bunch of no money deals or really poor offers, really bad offers. And so mm -hmm. um, we, um, and I ended up creating a hybrid path for the film. I think Richard was huge thinking that maybe it's the source of the echo, but I don't think it's so for some um, and. Um. Did you check your audio settings that you're speaking through your uh, through the mic and uh, like through the mic in the computer, wow. and that you're listening through your headset on your earphones? Because there is, a, especially on your side as well, because there is a specific yeah, I mean, it's setting. Automatic. I mean, I can plug in my headset again, and uh, yeah, I'm probably still going to hear. Oh, now I don't hear. Or at least for a little bit, it seems like there's now. Now there's here comes the echo again, but yeah, but not as bad. Uh, yeah, not as bad, and maybe. I can turn this down a little bit. And um, so I realized that I wanted my film to get a proper release, but that no one else was doing it. So I basically ended up um, creating a split right path for the film. So there were some distributor distribution entities that we decided to work with. And so but a lot of it fell on me. And I basically spent a year of my life releasing the film. And my executive producer, my producer slash executive producer, was the head of the board of IFP at the time. And he said, wow, you're doing something that I haven't seen before. You should write about it for Filmmaker Magazine. So I wrote a few articles that were really well received. Um, I guess the reason being is that I seem to take something that was very complex to filmmakers and break it down to its essential components and make it make it so that filmmakers really can understand what um, this mm -hmm. process was. And so people encouraged me to write a book. So you know, especially saying, "Hey, it will be the first book." Well, it makes a lot of sense, and they said, "Yeah, it makes a lot of sense." And so I wrote the book, um, which is "Think Outside the Box Office." Which, since we're on video, I guess yes, I can go over and grab a copy. Hang on. Yes, please. Wow, I'm actually running out of copies. They're out of print. To be honest, the digital ones are out of print. Oh, excellent. Um, and so I kind of wrote that book to kind of help filmmakers. And okay, so this is the book I would have liked when I released mm -hmm. the film here go out and release your films. And so, um, but then people started calling and saying, oh, well, we love the book, but we need help. And then I started doing workshops. I was encouraged to do a presentation, a workshop, and I really enjoyed doing it. And this kind of became a second career, essentially. 
that has yeah, kind of like, like, like you know, in a sense, been in my life. And so hence that leads me to the company Hybrid Cinema, um, and which is basically the company that actually published the book, but also I use as an umbrella, whereas my company that mm -hmm. help filmmakers, you know, strategize their releases. And then for a certain number of films um, at a time, we get involved in the releases in some supervisorial or really deeply involved. So it depends on you know how many projects, how much we like the project, et cetera. So um, and whether the filmmaker needs our services. So so it's uh, either a uh, it's that's a a, the the short very 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 short answer to your long question. No, it's actually a very interesting uh, one as well. So what you're also uh, essentially doing with that with the company then is what you are doing is acting as either a consultant or you're actually acting as their sales agent? No, I don't. Well, consultant, yes. Yeah. Sales agent, no. Like, I'm not a sales agent. Um, I do know some companies and I do make referrals, um, but I don't. Sales agents, you have to be, you know, you have to really be involved in that world on a regular basis. And um, that's not, you know, then I can do the other things that I do. So I'm not a sales agent. And um, I refer people to sales agents, but I'm not a sales agent. Um, so I'm actually a consultant or, as I call it, basically function as a producer of marketing and distribution, but I rarely take the credit. Um, and occasionally I do take the credit, but generally I function as that. I help coordinate releases. Um, we now have an in-house social media person, so we do social media in-house. Um, we do some of the outreach in-house, some of it we outsource or bring someone on board. Um, and you know, all the other kind of strategy and supervision is something that I kind of handle. Like if we need to bring on a publicist, a booker, or whatever, we bring those elements on, so. Mm -hmm. So what, what it, essentially it does is almost like an, in terms of like an aggregation type thing as well. No. <laughs> no, it's more of like a marketing services company. Okay, so, uh, okay, so it's helping yeah, we're market. Not, we're them. not really aggregators either because that's, you know, those are people who put your stuff up onto digital platforms. So we don't do that. But we will recommend aggregators to you, for instance. That's what, uh, well, that's exactly. Uh, okay, so you uh, handle the marketing campaign parts of it. Yes. Or it's like, uh, through the recommendations. And that's what most people need help with, I think, is, you know, the marketing of their films. That's the, you know, distribution is relatively easy. It's the market, you know, putting your, it's easy to put your film out onto platforms. Extraordinarily easy compared to how it used to be. Um, but getting people to want to watch your film is extraordinarily equally as hard as putting your film up on a platform is easy. Doing events is difficult, you know, yes. but the, the trick is how do you get people to want to see your film? So, and how do you want, how do you get your market to actually know that the film is out there? Yeah. So it's, and then, so it's putting together the social that's media. Number one, and then number two, once they know it's there, how do, how do you get them to want to watch it? Yeah, put their butt in the seat. Yeah, in either physically or metaphorically. Yes. So also, it's like you work now also in the, set of the indie world and now with this new transition also as well as marketing. So how are you finding like when you're working, do you work in different mediums like as in television also as well as also on different, uh, so if it was putting out a TV series versus putting out a film um, well, or a machinima? Right. Um, yeah, we haven't worked on a TV series yet. I'd love to work on a series. The advantage of series or any kind of serialized content is that one of the things that we're always striving for and often sometimes struggling with filmmakers is they have their film, but they don't have that many other assets besides their film. And these days, it's really important to have other kinds of content to promote content. And with series, not only do they have an ability they are conscious to create other content, but just the fact that mm -hmm. they're on, you know, on a weekly basis, you know, that they're delivering content on a regular basis makes it something that is better for engaging audiences over a period of time. So, that, absolutely, you know, so that's one of the things that would be, you know, very attractive to work on 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 series. We're also 
now working with a musician, we're starting to explore working outside, working with other creative artists and not just filmmakers. Yeah, it's like, and uh, so basically uh, that when you are doing that, it's like also it's working with them on promoting the series. It, do you find that also when you're looking at it from a marketing campaign point of view of dealing with both a series versus a film versus a different medium of how your social media platforms do differ or how does your campaigns differ? Because even though you do have essentially target markets, when you're dealing with with, uh, with television, you're dealing also with agents, like with the yeah, with the actual so, networks too. Yeah, I mean, it, depending on the, I mean, you have those kind of issues with larger feature films as well, but the the principles are essentially the same. I mean, you want to, you know, you want to try to engage audiences where they live. So, you know, basically for me, you know, it's this, it's a similar kind of audience development. And for me, audience, you know, engagement, like is basically a four step process. So the first thing is to identify who your audience is. Um, mm -hmm. Second thing is to find out where those audiences get information from. How do they find out, like, do they find out referrals from friends and where do their friends, you know, refer? Is it, are their friends on Facebook or Snapchat? Do they, you know, where do they kind of live in the um, referral universe? Um, third is that you have to think about what kind of value you're creating for your, uh, for your audience. So is it, you know, and the feature film can't be or shouldn't be the only piece of value. You have to create other forms of content to yes. engage your audience. Um, and what that content is depends on who your audience is. One piece, what value for one audience is going to be different from another audience. And the last thing is how does your audience consume media? Like, yes. will they go out and see a movie in a theater? What will cause them to see a movie in a theater? Do they need, does it have to be an event? Will they? you know, how will they consume it online or will they watch it on television, et cetera. So, you know, that's also something that's a little harder to find out, but something, you know, that is important to know. So when you're doing this also, it's like, cause each social media has its own format and its own sort of way about, do you have to then target it towards their forums as well? Or is it uh, using the campaign as a broad and general function? I think you should be try to be as specific, as targeted as specifically as you can. You know, mm -hmm. and especially in the beginning of a campaign, you really want to drill down to who the tribe is, who the fans are, who the committed audience, who's the core, super core of that audience. So <clears throat> when you say, what was the turn, what was it, listservs or, you know, um, yep. you, yeah, or yeah, bulletin board, sure, you know. Um, if that's something where that your audience reads and pays attention to, yes, it's somewhere that you should be. Yeah, because I know that with certain platforms, it's like you only have a few sound bites, basically, to be able to get your point across. It's like, mm -hmm. it, it, so it's a lot more challenging with it than with other platforms like with I think I believe with Twitter you have what 140 characters or something like that right you just have to conform your message to the medium you know okay the medium is the message as it were yes <laughs> someone very, very smart I think said that we all uh, have marked number of 40 years that, ago yes. or something 40 or 50 yes. years ago <laughs> what was uh, that you mentioned your book oh, <clears throat> oh. First of all, I apologize. It disappeared for a few minutes there. I've been having, with all the storming, I've been having Wi-Fi problems. So I Where moved into you? my, I'm in uh, South Florida. Oh. And uh, so I had to move into uh, the bedroom where my main PC is mm -hmm. in order to be able to continue with the show. And it doesn't seem like you have any clothes on your hangers. Uh, uh, no, that's you? because I'm way past due during... Um, way past due doing laundry. Oh, okay. But, uh, yeah, that's, so is this normal uh, weather for this time of year, or is this? Uh, yes, we are in the rainy season, but uh, it's not normal that the first five days of the rainy season have been so continuously rainy. Right. Yeah. So it's making um, the anti-rain campaign. <laughs> that's right. 
Now, uh, you mentioned your book earlier, uh, Think Outside the Box Office, The Ultimate Guide to Film Distribution and Marketing for the Digital Era, which I recommend as as a must-read book, for, especially for someone who's just getting started and needs to learn the ins and outs of how to market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The comment that 2007 was the tipping point in the collapse of the studio-based independent distribution model. Mm -hmm. A, can you elaborate on that? And B, in the decades since, have you seen any signs that things might be tipping back to the previous norm? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it was 2008 or 2009 that three films sold at Sundance. One of those then fell, one of those deals fell apart and it was resold at TIFF and maybe there were two sales at TIFF. And so one of those sales that had happened at Sundance and then fell apart. I forget exactly which year that was. Um, but that, you know, as far as some kind of barometer of like what the market is. And I think you can see from, okay, I'm gonna turn down my audio a little bit again because I hear myself um, echoing. Um, the Any kind of barometer you can see at Sundance and Tribeca and South by and, and um, can that sales are in a variety of different forms are you know happening so there is money and a lot of this is infusion of money from Amazon and Netflix and, other mm -hmm. digital platforms. and but again you know it's kind of like happening on a high profile level um, how much it filters down to films that so it's coming it's becoming robust for those you know that small percentage of films like if there's you know estimates of 50,000 potentially more feature films are made every year maybe half of those are good you know because a lot of people mm -hmm. know, their first film or you know there's uh, I talked to one one festival programmer who said that they get a lot of wedding wedding people think oh this should be you know in the film festival <laughs> so wow <laughs> I'm sorry, just because you're singing Havana Gila does not mean that you get to be part of the film festival. Yeah, well, you know, I don't know. Maybe some of those wedding videos are actually quite entertaining. But my impression was that they were not. Um, and um, so, you know, the market is much more robust now. But at the same time, and I, we're going to be posting an article, um, post can article, which is a little late, but it was really interesting <clears throat> talking about how there's a plethora of platforms out there now. Most of them don't have the kind of money, though, that Netflix and Amazon have, and that Netflix and Amazon have started to get a lot more picky about the kinds of content that they're acquiring, and they're spending a lot of money producing their own content. So it is a good time to be a content creator, but you know it's still kind of tough out there for independent filmmakers. And in the sense, maybe it's even tougher on some level because there's you know, a few main kinds of VOD revenue. So one main kind is transactional, which is like iTunes, when you rent or download or buy a film. Um, and the other main kind is SVOD, subscription, which is Netflix, Amazon, you know, Hulu, Plus, Pandora, Filmstruck, etc. cetera. Um, so the, as people, as consumers, shift more and more to having a few, mm -hmm. five, and okay, I'm gonna watch all my content, that's my budget. That makes filmmakers more reliant on those sales to S5 platforms, because if you don't have a super dedicated audience, the films that have a super dedicated audience, then transactional can still earn some revenue. But for films that don't, it's transactional revenue can be slimmer, you know, and tough. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a double-edged sword now with these sales happening, a lot of which, a lot of the money is coming from, you know, SVOD money. As you can see, a lot of the sales are from, you know, Amazon or Netflix or people competing yes. with them. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how the economics and case studies evolve over the next couple of years. Also, we've evolved as well from 2007 when we did have that crash, because also 2007 as well, we had uh, the bottom out of Britain 
as well during that time. So it's like, yeah, it has taken time with that. And are you feeling that we're actually going to be coming up on a new bottom out because it's like with the states bantering back and forth of do they keep 181, do they lose 181, do they uh, keep credits, do they not keep credits, and all of, uh, all of this bantering about between different states? Yeah, I mean, I think that's just a part of film financing, and maybe it's going to cut into financing a little bit. Um, but people will still make films, you know. Mm -hmm. um, maybe if there's, you know, with less funding, maybe there will be less films. I mean, one of the things that you find is that part of the problem here is that there's a glut of content, and that creates two problems. One is that there's, you know, what happens in supply and demand if the supply explodes and the demand stays either, you know, stable or only increases incrementally. Right, uh -huh. so what's going to happen? Prices are going to crash. This is my economics background, yes. right? So um, the other problem with exploding supply is that there's so much noise out there in the landscape that it makes it that much more difficult and potentially either time or money expensive to break through that. So you know how? So it's a double-edged sword. There's more content, prices lower, partially because of so much content. And then you also have to spend more time and resources cutting through the noise. Mm -hmm. So that sucks. Yes. Yes. No. Sorry to be uh, Debbie. Sorry to be Debbie Downer. Oh no! This is actually <laughs> I should, very. I should, get a, I should get a guest gig on Saturday Night Live. And, um, <laughs> hey, there's a big upsurge in independent film sales. Yes, but for many independents, you can't make that sale. Things are a little tougher these days. Wah, wah. <laughs> How was my Debbie well, Downer impression? Pretty good. Nice. Yeah, I like nice. it. Very nice. Yeah. You um, get two thumbs up from Cisco and Ebert. Okay. Yes, indeed. Uh, now, one thing that you highlighted in your book, uh, the statement, the more effort you put into your release, the better release you will have. Now, when you say it like that, you go, well, yeah, that's just simple logic. Mm -hmm. But do you feel that there is a lack of information regarding distribution and public marketing in today's film schools? And why is that? Yeah, let me just turn down my volume here because of the echo. Um, and I'm going to take a little Advil here. Um, hope to fend off a little headache I'm getting. So, yeah, I don't, you know, I have some feelings about this. I mean, Go so on. it's a double-edged sword. I think film schools, it takes a long time for film schools to adapt, you know, to um, what's happening. Some have adapted better, like NYU, like CalArts, I teach at CalArts. We, I, mm -hmm. NYU has tons of classes in this. Columbia has tons of classes in this, or a number of classes in this. They teach this. Um, there are, you know, in many schools, you know, so I think on the one hand, there are schools, or many schools are now teaching this in one way or another. So that's a good thing. Um, what I find, even at CalArts, is that filmmakers, especially young filmmakers, still don't think this is a problem that they think, especially with, you know, the news of sales being more robust, et cetera, you know, um, they don't feel like they need to learn about this. They don't need to learn about this. And so they don't take the class, you know. Um, I get as many kids from experimental animation at CalArts who know that they have to be entrepreneurial as mm -hmm. they do filmmakers, you know, um, and, you know, yeah, it's just so it's it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. I mean, um, another double-edged where a I think even now film schools, there are more film schools and schools are teaching this material. But then it's a matter: do the filmmakers want to learn? You know, and I think when filmmakers get out into the real world and they understand, you know, what's happening and how much they need to know it, then they know. Fuck, I should have taken that class. You know, but it's almost a little bit too late. So it's maybe not the film schools. It's maybe it's film culture still. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And because it is actually really important to reconcile both sides, as we've mentioned 
with uh, some previous guests as well. How, uh, how do you feel that you can marry those two sides? Because it's like a lot of people, when they go to film school, they see the artistic, they see the ideal scenario, but they don't really get what it's all about in the business. So what is our best ways of marrying those two in their mind to be able to give them a more well-rounded education? I don't know. I mean, I think it's better now. I mean, like I teach at the IFP filmmaker lab. I'm one of the I'm the senior lab leader at the IFP filmmaker lab, and especially the documentary filmmakers are very savvy about this now, like much more than they were eight years ago when I started working with the lab. So mm -hmm. there does seem to be at least outside of film school a bit of a learning curve going on, and people understanding that this is the lay of the land, etc. So to do it in film school, I mean, it's a little tough, you know, because film schools, yes. most film schools are expensive. And, you know, it's a tough sell to, hey, come and spend $100,000 going to film school. But, you know, look at the market outside of film school. It sucks. Yeah. So, um, but I think now with the market, you know, I think one of the things is that it's become, besides, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about is distribution of feature films. You know, there's, and one of the things that's changing, I think, also in film school is what is filmmaking. And yes. I think this kind of shifts from it having to be about only feature films. And I think students are getting that, that there's many different kinds of ways to create content. Um, and that it's a pretty exciting time for people coming out or starting out or coming out of film school because there's so many needs of people to create content um, that it, you know, is more, you know, I think there's generally more work out there, but I think the need for classes, some kind of class, and I've started incorporating that into my class, and to have classes where, you know, it really talks about, and that's what my, my class is geared towards, kind of surviving in the real world, um, and mm -hmm. having classes that kind of like, don't just talk about distribution, but talk about all the functional ways of how the real world works and the different opportunities that there are. I think that's important. Absolutely, because it's essentially a key towards helping you become a more well-rounded filmmaker as well. To and that understand that also, that. I mean, it's important to become a sustainable artist. You yes. Know, that's the big key is can you be sustainable? Like, can you sustain this as a living, you know? There's some I recommend to people. Um, Esther Robinson has written some amazing articles in Filmmaker Magazine about that. Mm -hmm. so I do recommend that you know Google Esther Robinson, Filmmaker Magazine. He's written a series of articles about it. She's really super brilliant. You know. Yeah, and you also mentioned about this thing called the New Fifty Fifty, <laughs> and how and how the concept, like how did the concept evolve over the years? So tell us a little bit about the new 50-50 and how did it evolve? Well, um, <clears throat> let's see. It's something that kind of struck me while I was writing the book um, and mm -hmm. kind of realizing how much time I spent releasing my film, how much time I meant making the film. You know, to be perfectly honest, it wasn't both expense for, for Bombit, it wasn't 50-50. But to me, I saw that for a lot of films it was on some level, and even looking at studio films, and they spend often as much money, often more money on marketing films than they do, than they do making the films. Um, so just to help get filmmakers out of that mindset that all I am responsible for is making big film. Um, but no, in fact, you're responsible for making the film. In most cases, you're responsible for making the film and connecting that film to an audience. Um, and whether it's not just you or someone else on your team mm -hmm. does, it's still the filmmaking team is responsible for that. I think that was, you know, when there aren't other people out there who are going to do this for you, what is the solution? It is, it is you. You know, it is your mm -hmm. filmmaking team. So, and it does, and the idea is to, you know, make sure that people, and the biggest problem I still find that filmmakers face is that they haven't saved money for distribution and marketing. That they, you know, and part of that is the unfortunate economics of film, that they're, you know, it's, or, or many independent films, is that they're just barely have enough money to make the film, but 
you know, I said, I think I said in the book, and I'd still say now, if you have $100,000 to make a film, you'll be better off if you make that film for 50000 you know, and then save $50,000 for connecting that film to an audience. You'll be yeah. much more ahead of the pack. Um, and now that's being, assuming that that film that has an audience. So, yes. you know, and that's one of the things I really encourage filmmakers to think about it. I know a lot of filmmakers complain, well, I don't want to think too much about my audience because it's going to affect my creativity. But at some point, someone on your team needs to be thinking about, is there an audience for this film? And if there is, how do we connect with that audience? And, you know, those kind of four basic points that I mentioned earlier. So, yep. you know, because even when I was working at Target Video way back when Punk Rocker, they, I realized that they were making these amazing, we were making these amazing um, documentaries of the punk rock scene, but barely anyone was seeing them, especially outside of California, that they had done one kind of trip to Paris and screened them a number of times in Paris. And that's when I decided to, you know, upon myself to book the films on like a band on tour. And mm -hmm. I, I booked like five or six tours of Europe, one tour of the United States or the Eastern United States. And, you know, unfortunately I didn't go on all of those, but I went on several of those and it was great, you know? And so, you know, that's why, yeah. you know, filmmakers have to think more like that. And that's kind of like, in a sense, when I look back, that was probably the kind of like genesis of that thought. Um, but, um, and I don't think it really, necessarily evolved, you know, over time, but it probably was percolating because, you know, even with Better Living Case Circuitry and Cleopatra's Second Husband, you know, to be honest, Better Living Through Circuitry, I was very involved in the release and I feel like we did a really good job for Cleopatra's Second Husband. I had the impression that I was going to be involved in the release. I was actually pretty tired from the release of Better Living Through Circuitry. But still, I thought I was going to be involved in it, but then they didn't want me involved. And to be perfectly honest, I think it really suffered because of that. So, um, you know. Yeah. That's a but, nice, another nice long yes. answer to your well, short question. But Well, no, it's you, actually a very good answer for it because it's like it, it does, it's like the artist should be involved within their marketing as well. Yeah. And then, you know, a lot of what we talk about, um, you know, it's kind of like something we talk about in the labs a lot is that, you know, this is your baby, your film is your baby. And, you know, unfortunately, it seems like a lot of filmmakers want to take their babies and just give it away to the first orphanage that will take them, you know, when they're yeah. done. And some orphanages are actually quite good. You know, mm -hmm. um, there's some pretty good orphanages these days. They kind of fell away from them. There were some good ones, and then kind of, you know, there was a big collapse of the market like we talked about. There's some yep. really good orphanages out there that will really treat your kid well, you know. Um, but you want to, you know, before you um, agree to give your kid to an orphanage, you got to make sure that it makes sense. And it makes sense for what your goals are with your time. To just yes. extend or even ridiculously long. Um, and you got to talk to other parents who have kids at that orphanage. Really important to talk yeah. to uh, filmmakers who have their films at a distributor. You know, you just have yeah. to really make sense that because there's still many filmmakers who do small deals with orphanages and are very unhappy with how their child was treated. Well, do you feel that also now we've started a new way of transparency in regards to that? Because it's like this has been something that has been a hard-fought battle of getting transparency amongst distributors. and it, it depends, and that's where you really have to pick, you know, pick your distributor, pick your orphanage, and make sure it's yeah. one that's going to, you know, you know, where you're going to actually be able to come and talk to them and, you know, where they're going to give you reports and et cetera. So, and there are more trends. I mean, that is, it has improved. There are more like that. But, um, you know, it's, it's also because of digital. Digital is such a numbers game that a lot of distributors are bringing on, taking on a lot of content in order to make money from as many sources as possible. And so, yeah. You know, it really depends on, you know, 
you know, how much, you know, situations surrounding the acquisition. That kind of brings us to the idea of the distribution co-op. Uh, right, which is important in the digital age. Can you explain how that works? Well, I don't know if it's like I know you pulled that. To me, it's more of a kind of filmmaking co-op kind of a thing where mm -hmm. you have like a group of filmmakers working together, and um, you know they take turns, you know, directing, producing, working on the distribution of their films. And there's a number of those. Names are all escaping me right now, unfortunately. But there's a number of those that have sprung up, and you know, sometimes the filmmakers get so successful that they don't need that anymore. But there's a number that function kind of out of New York in that way, where you know, so that everyone just kind of takes turns on what they're doing on a project. So, which I think it makes a lot of sense. Like, if this, it's one way to deal with this notion that. You know, you're going to have to. Someone on your team is going to have to do this work. You know, mm -hmm. that's, where I, that's why I created the concept of the producer of marketing and distribution, or PMD, so that at least, you know, by creating a crew position, I wanted to give a sense that this was important and that, you know, there was, you know, it was important as important as the DP and the editor, et cetera, that someone that would be a high enough profile position that it really gave it some gravitas and, you know, would encourage, you know, be a line item in the budget and encourage people to save money for it. And that hopefully people would try to train and become them, you know. And there are some sprouting up, I think. And there are a number of people who are doing quite, you know, good jobs at it. The, I think the, um, you know, a little bit of the problem is that um, it's hard, it's been a little bit hard to sustain a community because again the money for films is so small i mean for release, that filmmakers aren't saving enough money for releases so you know that's a little bit it's, that's changing and i see more and more people coming up and doing this work and more and more films having the resources to pay someone so i think that's great i think that's a good sign which is also great. And now that person who you're actually mentioning in regards to it, you uh, you had made mention of that they're probably somebody who isn't connected created to the creative process. I um, to me the the best person in this is that they're they are connected to the creative process that they're mm -hmm. involved from inception that they're helping identify audiences and they're helping to conceive of content that can be shot um, at the same time. You know. Um, as the main piece of content is being created, I think that there is room for this being a creative position. You know, whether how many people can actually be function almost as a creative producer and also, you know, marketing and distribution, you know, it's just different people are going to have different skills, but I think the potential is for it to be creative. And I've heard from a lot of producers mm -hmm. that, you know, this is really the producer's job. But, you know, on a lot of smaller films or even bigger films, the producer has so many other things to do, they don't have time to do this, you know, and they're pulled in so many ways. And so it's still left a little bit by the wayside, you know, so. Mm -hmm. It does so, make perfect sense. Yeah. Um, also, I have noticed. Sense. Yes. Also, I'm going like, to lean back and see if I can. No problem do this hang out a little bit more relaxed for a few minutes hey why not <laughs> that's my doctor oh it's a taxi driver on the one side and dr mabuza fritz lang dr mabuza the gambler on the other side oh nice yeah, i love that movie oh my god it's one of my favorite which the doctor mabuza it's my favorite no fritz it's lang. the testament of dr mabuza not dr mabuza the gambler it's the third part of that series Oh, Sweet. Okay. Yeah. Well, the so gambler absolutely blew me away when I saw it. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I happen to like Taxi Driver. The uh, yeah. the other one. On the other side. I like both of them very much. Yes. Yeah. It, it's like oh my gosh! It's like yeah. Now you're taking me back to the Wayback Machine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll be, I'll pull myself back from the Wayback Machine. Okay. It, so I noticed so also that you did vomit and vomit too. So mm -hmm. now you had two different re uh, release strategies. What exactly changed with 
the release of Vomit 2 to the original? Well, Vomit 2 actually started off as a web series. Um, mm -hmm. so, it, um, so it was already released online before I decided to put it together as a feature. And to be perfectly honest, I probably waited a little too long to put it together as a feature. Um, mm -hmm. That I probably should have done it pretty cl closer to when it was a web series and because um, there was a window because Netflix had bought Vomit and had paid a decent amount for it um, and I wanted to capitalize on that but by the time I did it Netflix had kind of changed started to change and started buying less smaller films and um, I guess they had also kind of like had kind of an overdose of graffiti films so anyway so but I'm glad I did it because it's still you know um, you know kind of out there and you know it's a little hard it maybe you know just to reveal like you know I maybe should have called it something else besides vomit too I think by mm -hmm. making it a sequel like making it seem like a sequel I think it hurt it I, I in the film world it was able to take advantage of the branding of vomit so that was the good thing but the bad bad thing is it's still an independent film world and I don't think the independent film world is super crazy about sequels like that I think that you know there maybe has a little bit of a bad reputation from the studio world so um, you know that's probably yeah, that's something probably I would have done yeah, over again, over again. And, and but it was you know it was cool yeah, it was like cool. you know it was one of the very it was a very early web series um, and what was interesting about it at the time just the making of it I think is actually a little bit more fun to talk about than the distribution mm -hmm. is that when I was touring traveling the world you know giving workshops for the book that I actually wherever I went do a talk or a presentation or many of the places I went to do a talk or presentation I would actually shoot an episode for Vomit 2 so when I um, gave a keynote at CPH Docs um, uh -huh. back in 2009 I shot um, um, a couple you know two pretty prominent one prominent street artist one prominent graffiti writer um, and, and um, when I went to Australia, I shot a number of people in Australia, went to Southeast Asia, shot a bunch of people in Southeast Asia, etc. So um, the one place where I wasn't screen doing any workshops that I did go to was Israel and Palestine. And that's one of the Nice. Places. So that was nice. It was nice. They paid my way and, you know, it was, it was, and that was really, really fascinating. Yeah, it's like the experiences in Israel are like no other in yeah. terms of, yeah. 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 It's so, just awe striking. Yeah. 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 So um, those were made for Belgium, which, you know, since, you know, has since gone defunct. It, but mm -hmm. um, it was an effort to create kind of like an interesting content platform. And they created a lot of good stuff, but it just wasn't, you know, it was too early for that kind of model, I think. You were just ahead of your time. Uh, always. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're just a trendsetter. Okay. I'll I'll take the compliment. Okay. <laughs> now, uh for the book Selling Your Film Without Selling Your Soul, you did a an essay on uh Ride the Divide. Before we get into that, I just want to say wanted to show you that they do credit you with oh. the best and the brightest. So you might want to talk to them about uh, giving credit to the person who actually wrote that article, which was very good. Oh, when what was that? Where can you send me the link to that article? Uh, well, this is from from the book "Selling Your Film Without Selling Your Soul." Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That's oh, you mean in terms of writing that article? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Huh. Okay. Well. All right. Well, let's take a look at. Let's talk about Ride the Divide. Let's talk about Ride the Divide because yes, uh, you spend a great deal of time in that one talking about how they targeted their market. Right. 
And uh, how does that affect the whole process? Because it was really interesting. Yeah. So one thing, let me first say that um, I did. I wrote. I wrote uh, selling your film without selling your soul with uh, four, three other people: Sherry Candler, Orly Ravid, and Jeffrey Winter. So it was a collaborative effort, and um, it was quite fun, and still really good friends with all those folks. Um, and so. About Ride the Divide, like, so they, you know, what's interesting about them, I mean, they're kind of interesting as kind of case studies of filmmakers because they really, I mean, a lot of their films have been kind of about outdoor bicycling, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. other kinds of outdoor adventures. So they really kind of have cultivated this niche. And, you know, one of the sustainable models or the way that I think, not necessarily sustainable models, but can become a sustainable model is one of the ways to think about, you know, making a film and choosing a subject is to look for audiences that maybe are underserved in terms of media and to create content for them. So, um, especially audiences that will pay for media. Um, mm -hmm. They definitely found this audience because they, you know, this kind of outdoor, you know, um, biking, bike enthusiast audience was certainly underserved, and they definitely they went were smart by going to bicycle shops and, um, you know, and talking to bicycle magazines. And this is a little while ago, so I'm a little bit fuzzy on it. Um, and but they definitely, they especially went after that 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 one movie is about a bike race from um, Canada to Mexico along the Continental Divide. And mm -hmm. they um, really paid attention to the audience. Like they created events, when the film came out, they created events along that, along that same geographic territory. So they not only identified their audience in terms of interest, but also geographically. And one of the things I think that I was very impressed by what they did is they actually found musicians who live along the Continental Divide in the cities that they knew they were going to be screening the film and chose musicians in those cities so that then with the agreement that when the film premiered that those musicians would come out and play and support the film, not just play and support the film, but would have their audiences as well support, you know, kind of promote the film to their own, to their, to the musicians' audiences which is really, you know, kind of smart. And um, they also approached national bike organizations as well as local bike organizations and bike shops. Um, they found that, you know, there was good things that came out of the national organizations, but in terms of getting butts and seats, a lot of the local organizations were extraordinarily effective, potentially more effective than the national groups. You know, there's a there's a lot to be said about that, which is why I you know use it as a case study. I thought that what it was you know what they are how they are approaching what they are doing is really interesting. They also do you know a fair amount of brand and sponsor involvement, which makes a lot of sense for their kinds of films. And that's one of the things about starting early is that by starting early, they can kind of engage those potential sponsors from the beginning and even you know offer them product placements so that their products are actually in the film on the bikes where the people are actually wearing the clothes that their you know that the sponsor provides so that you don't end up with a situation at the end with a film where you know the person's wearing all one kind of clothing and that person that company isn't interested in sponsoring the release but there's another company that might be interested, but since you're already showing one, you know, another company's brand, they're not going to be as interested. Mm -hmm. And this gets into the whole notion of branded entertainment. Um, and there's also going to be an interesting article we're going to be posting coming up on my Facebook page um, about the shift of like what is working in branded entertainment and whether it you know, short form content or frankly, that the long form content where brands can actually even recoup expenses um, on the film, but also are providing a uh, more interesting piece of content, something that's more creative to um, consumers that is potentially interesting. So, and that's what these guys are doing here, making a feature film. Um, 
and involving the brands and helping, having the brands either spend money on the making of the film, give some money for the making of the film, or um, for the promotion of the film. Mm -hmm. Be careful of this because, for instance, if you want your film to be on PBS, this is very much not allowed. So, right. And you have to make sure that uh, with regards to that, that it's extremely important to yes. understand PBS's standard. Yeah, and not just PBS, but there's other broadcasters that have rules against this. But if you're going, if you're in a, if you're making a film that you don't think is even going to be likely to be broadcast, you're going directly to fan, then mm -hmm. you don't have to worry. Which is what these guys are doing. You don't have to worry about it as much. So uh, that book, uh, Selling Your Film Without Selling Your Soul, which I think is just absolute must reading for a one of the new filmmakers. Uh, that yeah, one, yeah. also selling your film outside the U.S., they're both available from the collaborative. They're and also available if you sign up. Also, if you sign up for my mailing list, if you go to my my soon to be old blog, you want to see my old mm -hmm. blog for one of the last times. You know, the last week of my old blog. You can go to johnreese.com backslash blog, um, and uh, you can sign up and receive. In the upper left hand corner, there's a uh, a way that you can sign up for my website and get a link to the book, selling your film without selling your soul. So yes, and and, and it's free. It's available. It's free. The whole book yeah. is free. So there's, folks, there's no excuse for not reading this book. Oh exactly. no, definitely not. And also. And they can also order your book, uh, Thinking Outside the Box Office, from your site as well, correct? Yeah, there's a store on my site, and the book is available for sale as a PDF. Um, so um, I just didn't want to reprint it. I, and the book needs a bit of a rewrite, so I didn't want to you know, reprint it in its current form. So one of these days, maybe I'll find enough time to rewrite the book. Sounds uh, sounds really good. Now, also, yeah. John, I know that next time we're going to be talking about a heck of a lot more uh, than that, including also this book, as well as also some of these new articles that are coming up. But in mm -hmm. the meantime, also, how do people get you in social media? Oh, so um, I have a Facebook page, um, Reese.John on Facebook. Um, you can probably just search for me, John Reese, J O N R E I S S. You can, if you're going to my blog, there's still links there. You can also go to my website, hybridcinema.com, um, and you can get in touch with me there. Um, and then also, I'm on Twitter at John underscore Reese. Um, and the one thing I should mention, I'm also doing Facebook Lives every two weeks now, um, and so the next one will be next Tuesday. Um, so people, if you have questions that you want me to answer, whoever's listening to this now and within the next week, you can either go to my Twitter or my Facebook page and post a question for me to be, handle on my Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. Is uh, and so uh, I look forward also that to the next time as well as also hearing all about that. Mm -hmm. So please, please do uh, keep us updated on that. And also, Arpo, how did they get you on social media? Well, they can get me on my Facebook page, Richard Pochard. Uh, they can find me uh, for business on LinkedIn, also under my name, Richard Pochard. Uh, I've been known to haunt the forums of the movie is underground from time to time. And of course, hey, just talk to me on Skype. It's cool. I like talking to people on Skype. And uh, do make sure, though, that you tell me that you're a fan of movie time because I've been getting way too many marriage offers from Armenian women. I don't know why. And yeah, how come you haven't taken them up on that offer? Are you already married? I hate Armenian cooking. It's just it's a, it's just a personal thing. No, I, I'm a widower, but, uh, you know, I've, I've, I feel like I've had my one time, and I'm all good with that. Okay. Yeah. Had a very happy marriage. Cool. And you and you can get me on LinkedIn, Bizipedia, um, Facebook, Twitter uh, at Snada Grayson at uh, Movie Time Indie, as well as also, oh goodness, it's like a, as I say, I have about four and a half pages of different all fourteen sites, 
that we have for the show, as well as also on the, this Yahoo page, yeah, the Yahoo YouTube. Goodness, it's like, as I say, if with four and a half pages of footprint, if you can't find me, you're just really not stalking me hard enough. Yeah, and the other thing I should say is I do consult on films, and so if you're interested, you there's on the go to Hybrid Cinema. There's a form to fill out, and we'll be in touch. Absolutely, and I look forward to also hearing more about that too, because we're going to talk all about the consulting service. We'll we'll be going through another long chat in our next time, and also, cool. Trust me, there it's like I, we have about fifty more questions that we want to ask you. Okay, great. <laughs> all right, so talk to you guys next week, and thank you so much. And thank oh, no, you. It'll be next month. Next the month. Oh, we're going to do it next month. Yes, okay, so it in July. is. July. You are correct. July the 14th. That is, you and, uh, that is when we do this all over again backwards. Okay. Yeah, we'll that's... have to, because that's not a Wednesday. Okay. We'll it's a Friday, Friday show. Yeah. Okay. We'll figure that out. Perfect. Might, that might be a hard night for me. I thought it was June 14th. Okay. We'll, let's email about that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We can, we, we, can, we can move it if that's a bad night for you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We, we can move it to the 12th, actually. If you that's like. probably better. Then let's do the 12th. Okay. There okay, you go, audience. Well. You heard it here first. The 12th. Okay, great. July Alrighty. 12th. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Goodbye.